So we're just going to start in with a, a case just to frame this. 83-year-old woman with multiple comorbidities, COPD, chronic renal failure, osteoporosis, moderate dementia, resident of your facility for three years. Um, so longer than the average um, of 18 months. Uh, she has a chronic mild to moderate pain related to osteoarthritis and diabetic neuropathy, well controlled with acetam, and my spelling is atrocious, I do apologize. Um, you, recent, she, you recently diagnosed breast cancer, metastatic to bone, carides, request analgesic medication as she is having lots of pain. So 6 out of 10 at rest, so this is the piece, 9 out of 10 with movement. So incident pain, one of the most, there's like 15 uh, di identified difficult pains and incident pain is one of them. Behaviors noted are yelling, shouting with movement, appetite is reduced, seems to be withdrawing from her social group. So the WHO analgesic stepladder, who has seen this before? Some but not all. Okay, so um, a very, very useful approach to assessment of um, uh, malignant and non-malignant pain. So you've got three steps, mild pain, moderate pain, severe pain. Mild, you're going to be using the non-opioids, which are acetaminophen, NSAIDs, although NSAIDs, I'm sure Ted will have some comments about the use of NSAIDs, given that they're on the beers, beers list. Weak opioids, so what are the weak opioids that we might use? Just yell them out. Tramacet, tramadol, codeine. Anything else? Anything new that might be given as a patch? Buprenorphine, excellent. So that's in the weak opioid category. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Severe, shout them out. Hydromorphone, fentanyl, methadone, sufentanyl, morphine, one more, oxy. Okay, so then with this um, analgesic ladder, adjuvant treatments can be added at any step. So in a defini definition of an adjuvant, is a medication which is not an analgesic, but which has analgesic effect. So neuropathic pain adjuvants, the treatments we use are classic. So what are they? What would we use? Gabapentin, gabapentinoids, Lyrica, Carbamazepine, Cymbalta, I have used it occasionally, yep. For central pain, central post-stroke pain, I've used it. Very good. Nozanan, I think that it is purported to have analgesic effects. And when I actually started looking to find out where's the evidence for us using methotrimiprazine or Nozanan for analgesic benefit, I couldn't find it. Everybody's referencing each other. There was an original article in like 1972 or something. They reference it, and then someone references that article, and then, but I can't, I, there's a little bit for, um, I'm trying to remember what the one antipsychotic is, because I think the benefit is mostly uh, not in um, actual physical pain reduction, but in its effect on total pain, reduces some of the anxiety. Did you have a comment about it? No, I think, uh, nortriptyline. Nortriptyline. <laughs> yeah, nortriptyline, Elevil. But we're going to talk about their use in, in your patient population as well, or the lack thereof. <laughs> Pregnisone. Steroids. Steroids. So when the residents are coming to me and they're presenting a case, and I'm listening to them go, okay, this is an excellent person with whatever metastatic disease, and they have pain, and they've got nausea, and they've got shortness of breath, and then, okay, what medications are they on? And I'm, trying really hard to pay attention, but I'm listening for one thing. And I'm listening to hear if they're already on a steroid. Because if they're on a steroid, I'm going, shoot. Because that is such an easy intervention. The dexamethasone, pregnisones, they are palliative care secret weapon to help control pain. As they are underused. People are frightened of them. Oh, they're on diabetes. We can't put them on it because they've got diabetes. Well, you either increase their oral hypoglycemics or you address it with insulin should not be a barrier. Oh, it's going to make them confused. It's going to make them agitated. Give a trial and see. <clears throat> so thank you for that. There's a fourth step here too. Oh, pardon? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ten. <laughs> Ten points. <laughs> yes. 
and I think I'll offer up a couple of points back there for the Nazanin comment as well. Thank you for that. Um, so there's, I think I've got some other things I can put in here. So the mantra is by the mouth, orally, if you can, by the clock, malignant pain that is severe in nature. This is directly direct quote from the article. Malignant pain that is severe in nature deserves treatment with strong opioids delivered round the clock. By the latter. So often, even uh, acetaminophen, we say PRN. What's the problem with PRN in your in the facilities in your? It's not going to be given. It's not going to be given. So weak opioids. Not my favorite. Has anybody taken Tramacet? Taken Tramadol? Any, who in this room has taken? I've taken it. I had a, a interaction with my beautiful Labrador where he went after a cat. And I tried to separate the cat from the dog without much success. And he bit the end of my finger off. And so I went and had a, a surgical procedure done. And they gave me Tramadol, or Tramacet. And the whole night long, I was twitching twitching, twitching, and I thought, what the heck is this? I'm also on citalopram. So what it does is it works on the descending inhibition of pain, um, and it's an uh, inhibitor of serotonin reuptake. So while I wasn't in a full-on serotonin syndrome, I'm pretty sure I was twitching because my serotonin levels were up a little bit. Many of our patients are on um, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. There's lots and lots of drug interactions with tramadol. I don't particularly like this in the elderly. Um, in my frail patients, I tend not to use it. Can you make a comment though, because you have more experience yeah, so in this group? Yeah, so I would say that would be my thing to say smoking <coughs> is close to patient is as bad as pain for a number of people. But I've seen a lot of people. And I find tramadol is much less close to pain. And it does is serotonergic. There is a very small group like Christine, so I don't use it when people are on SSRIs as a go-to drug. And, you know, if the, uh, and, and the majority of people I've given who are not on an SSRI, it's been great. It's been a great drug, so and the only downside of it is not covered by Pharmacare. That, that's been my experience. It's not, not covered by Pharmacare. So I will use Tramadol when I think they would benefit from the descending inhibition of pain. So if someone's got neuropathic pain and they require a weak opioid, I will also use it over the codeine. If I see somebody on codeine, I tend to take them off, okay. unless there's a reason. Lots of drug interactions. We don't know if they're an underutilizer, an over, you know, rapid metabolizer, a non-metabolizer. Um, and the, the use, it's hard to use PRNs with it because people are writing T3s because it's easier to write the prescription and rather than pulling out your duplicate prescription pad and actually writing with the coding. The one thing about Tramadol that is do watch as you're uh, pushing the dose up um, because it does lower the seizure threshold and there is a sealing dose in the uh, the side effect of um, seizures. I can't remember what the dose is because they don't actually use it that often. Do you yeah, remember the dose? Me, yeah, I just want to mention dosing with Tramadol. I use a lot of Tramadol, Tramacet. And I start people on half a tablet in this age group. Some people are beautiful. That's all they need. Half a tablet plus a Tylenol, 500 milligram Tylenol. That's it. You take them up to a whole tablet, then they start to get a little bit wonky. Or there may be some side effects. So, you know, like the old geriatric adage is start low, go slow, but I'll say, but go. Don't stop. That's where people get hung up. Is they don't reassess. So I, I yeah. want to talk a little bit about the difference between the pain you might be treating in that setting and malignant pain. So if someone's, because that's what I'm supposed to be talking about, it's malignant pain. So if somebody has got a malignancy, the likelihood is it's going to progress, right? Sorry. And that their pain is going to progress. So if we start them here on a weak opioid, the likelihood is at some point we're going to have to move into a strong opioid. So what I do is I just start them on a strong opioid at a much lower potency. So I might use morphine because I can get away with one or two milligrams every four hours, and it's really low potency. 0.5 of hydromorphone would be the equivalent of um, like 2.5. So, so when I know I've got malignant like, pain, it's more likely than two pounds. I just pop here so I'm not making a lots and lots of different changes. <clears throat> 
Okay, so which one do you choose? So you've got our, I think she was 83 years old. Sorry, it's not coming through very well, but she's 83. Um, she's got malignant pain, probably bone metastatic disease, and she's got um, incident pain. So how do you choose which one to start? Who would, in this case, start with morphine? Remember points for participation. Anybody start with morphine? Who would start with hydromorphone? Okay, um, oxycodone. Who would put them, this opiate naive person on a fentanyl patch? Say no, say no, say no. Okay, methadone, anyone have their methadone license? Would you use it in this person? Um, I was oh, <laughs> that's okay, no worries. No, I'm not gonna challenge you anymore. I, I ran, I, I saw a, see that's why I don't do PowerPoints, people daydream. So I um, uh, saw an old guy at home, 87 years old with prostate cancer, metastatic uh, to bone, and he had terrible knee pain. This was just like three days ago. And um, he had been delirious on almost every opioid his uh, very capable family doc had put him on. And so I actually started him on methadone. Um, and um, the nurse is going to see him today, but I started him on one milligram TID of methadone, hoping that that will help with some of his pain. So I'm, buprenorphine I don't use for malignant pain, but I'm beginning to see its benefits in uh, non-malignant pain of mild to moderate severity in osteoarthritis, and in particular because I'm using, uh, seeing lots more dialysis patients. Um, because um, it's, it's this in renal failure. So your patients, right, probably will have an element of renal insufficiency. And as they move closer to death, as they become more and more dehydrated, probably they're gonna move into their more pre-renal failure and their EGFR is gonna be dropping, dropping, dropping. And as their EGFR drops, they're gonna start accumulating the metabolites of um, the opioids. And in particular, which is the one we particularly worry about in renal failure? Does anybody know? Morphine. So typically what happens in someone with, who's got um, a malignancy is they're started on morphine, which is a very appropriate first dose, or first uh, choice of opioid. And then maybe they get nauseated, and they throw up, and they get dehydrated. They go into pre-renal failure, and they start accumulating, um, in particular, M3G, which goes into the brain and causes um, uh, neurotoxicity, and so they become delirious. So that's a very typical pattern. So you could treat that with rehydration, but probably rotation is appropriate. So for many of your patients, I probably would start, um, I don't know what, what you think, but I would start, if I'm looking at a strong opioid, I would probably start with hydromorphone. When, um, oxycodone would be a close second, although I'm not real keen on oxycodone, and the main reason being, for me, it's very practical. Because as you can see, it, it comes as PO, but not parenteral. So when I'm th I know that my patient at some point is gonna stop swallowing, I'm gonna need to use a subcutaneous injection, and I'm gonna be going, oh my gosh, what is gonna be the equivalent dose? Now, what do you think about oxycodone 10? <clears throat> and that's because of the long acting version is almost inaccessible. They took oxycontin off the market. Right. And oxymeo is a pain. They're taking that off the market site. So just don't use it anymore unless people don't have trouble with the other drugs. Right. Yeah. So back to you are talking about the buprenorphine, where you, you stepped onto the renal failure issue. That oh, they, sorry, so you, yes. You I think it is good? I do think them. it is good for chronic pain. Yeah. And and I know in renal failure? It, in renal failure. Um, it is very expensive. It's a patch that goes on, and you can put it on an opiate naive person, and you don't actually change it for seven days. So it's really nice. Um, I know in Calgary they're using it more and more in their frail renal failure patients. And if somebody has a drug plan, I will sometimes use it. But I, I honestly, I can't promote it that much because I've used it like a handful of times. Mm -hmm. But with good success. And what's your comment? I, I just say I've used buprenorphine a fair amount. Um, and there's, you know, the three distinct advantages are renal failure, as Christine mentioned, weekly application, like fentanyl patches every 72, 48 hours which get confusing for people. Um, and the third thing is it's opiate naive people. So it's relatively safe and it's not 100% safe. So sometimes if I'm very worried about someone, I'll start them on half of a five 
just to see how they do with that, because I've seen people confused, like the 94-year-old, cognitively impaired, 80-pound person. But um, I found it's, it's a, you know, there is a place for it, and but the cost is, a very, is an issue. The five microgram patches are cheap, but once you get up over 10, then it's it's expensive to use it. And um, if people have a drug plan, it's not an issue. And when you use a half of a patch, how do you do that? What do you tell the staff? Yeah. So the way, the way we always use a half a patch is we'll use a, a tegaderm patch. First, put tegaderm on the skin. And you tell, we teach the patient's families, you apply half of it on the skin, half of it over the tegaderm. And that's the way we do the fentanyl. That's where we handle mostly fentanyl and very, very occasionally with buprenorphine. And you can use the second half later then? No, 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 it's, you can't, unfortunately. So it's very rare I'll use half of a buprenorphine. And I'd say for the 99% of the people you're going to see, five micrograms, Christine, what's the equivalent, dose equivalent to buprenorphine and morphine? Oh. Lord, I have to look it up. It's small. It's You're talking about two Tylenol 3s. Yeah, roughly. So that's you know, one to two Tylenol 3s for a five microgram patch is nothing. Yeah. And you know, you're dealing with like five milligrams of morphine. You know, it's a very tiny dose. The challenge I have is when I, they, their pain is escalating and then now I've got this buprenorphine patch and I have to figure out what then I'm going to rotate the patient to. And that's a bit of a complex calculation, but it's doable. And what it is, it's a mixed agonist-antagonist. Yeah. And so there was, an, when it initially came out, people said, well, you can't use then a, a breakthrough hydromorphone or a breakthrough morphine because the antagonist is going to get in your way. But yeah. actually, the studies that's have shown that you can still, yes, you can save it. Yeah. You can use it. And, and again, I would just to end the buprenorphine, because yeah. I know you have to get on, is that's that, okay. um, Again, there's a dose ceiling with this drug. Fentanyl is a beautiful drug. There's not a dose ceiling. You know, but you, you have to be very, very careful. People are opiate naive, extremely careful. And we're going to talk about that one of the cases. Okay. But the buprenorphine, you know, once you hit 20, you're, you're talking about 20 milligrams of morphine, you know, small dose of morphine. And these people, as Christine's talking about malignant pain, you know, these people have got escalating levels of pain as their disease progresses. So. I think it's got a tiny um, niche, and it would be people who are intolerant of other things. That's when I would go to buprenorphine with malignant pain. So. And when you, I uh, went to a talk with Paul Winston, the rehab doctor, and he is a big fan of buprenorphine yeah. for his patients with osteoarthritis as he's trying to get them moving. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're talking about topicals, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes perfect. Yeah, okay. Christine, uh -huh. just a general comment about now which is in practice in facilities, uh -huh. pharmacy and nursing are yeah, so I think the idea is, is that you're only, so what they do is when you put the patch on, um, it goes into the subcutaneous tissue and it creates a pool of medicine that then acts as like an infusion that the body continuously draws on. And so that's why, you know, in the hospital, you'd actually be given a subcutaneous or an IV infusion of it because it's so short acting. When you're using a patch, you're actually giving that kind of an infusion yeah. that they're taking from their own subcutaneous good pool. Um, and so the idea is if you cover up half, and you only get half the medicine. But in actual fact, you know, there's probably some that gets pulled over by diffusion. And so we're fooling ourselves a little bit that we're only giving half a patch. But it does seem, it seems logical, anecdotally to work. Yeah. Um, but in the, terms of ordering it, you know, the pharmacy doesn't like it, the nurses don't. Catherine, not in reality, though, we do it all the time. I, I have patients that brought me, yeah. and I just had someone on six micrograms of fentanyl. Yeah. They do it. I'm so, not saying it's not done, but did we just talked about this recently. I know, they don't like it. So. There's all kinds of bureaucratic barriers. But so so, so they, they will say that because they've read their thing, and that's the advice they have to give. Yes. Right? Mm. But what what is on the paper is different than what we actually do and it we it's a very common practice for us to do that and you just have to be firm with them and say we're going to do it yeah it's got to be done just yeah, but, but it does create a bit of tension so yeah. if the nurses are instructed to not to follow this practice and we're ordering and saying yes then so maybe we need to, so if you guys, that's an impact that you guys can have in your facilities by perhaps pulling together a group that might discuss discuss the use. Because it, this stuff does require a team. Pain requires a team, palliative care requires a team. And so we have to make sure that everybody's on board. And so we might get together and, and talk about initially start from the same place, 
of wanting to make sure the patient is well cared for, right? And so everybody can agree with that. It's like having a family meeting. You start with a common understanding. We're going to, we want to do the best what's for the patient. And here's the issue we're going to talk about and how are we going to make sure the patient is best cared for. And then you can begin to get people on board. It's goals of care, right? And it's all, and it's goals of, goals of our team interaction. So you, you, you know, when I say it's got to be done, sometimes you have to say that, but the reality is, uh, is that we need to, um, continue to have excellent relationships with our team members. And I understand the pharmacist Bruce, I can't remember what his name is, but he's over at St. Paul's. And he says, you can't do that. You can't do that. And he is a PhD pharmacist. And he's right, the studies do not support it. Um, however, it's a common practice. We do it all the time. And um, the other thing he says is you can't cut the fentanyl patches. Um, and Pippa Holly uh, is someone who, they've changed the matrix, apparently you can cut them. I never cut them, I'm too afraid to cut them. There's two types of patches, I know. I know. and you have to ask your pharmacist. So there's one that you can cut, um, that's safe to cut you out. And I always call the pharmacist and I get them to look, look it up, double check. Because the thing is, if you cut it, it leaks out, right? The, the, and you're not sure what they're getting. But there is a patch now where the matrix, it's embedded in the matrix so it doesn't leak. And you just have to ask for it. And it depends what, you know, the generic of the month is that Pharmacare is supporting. I'm still too afraid to do it, just in case there's a mistake. Yeah. Someone comes along after me and orders it, and it's the different one, and they cut it because they've always cut it. So I just, I don't do that. I just do the take it piece. Me too, most yeah. of the time. So, um, okay, I have three more minutes. Um, uh, fentanyl and sufentanyl sublingually, I just, I'm going to mention it later, but excellent for incident pain and incident dyspnea as well. So side effects, um, so I just want to briefly uh, speak about side effects. You guys are all familiar with these. Um, constipation would be very common. It doesn't mean that we don't give them. Patients will be reluctant, sometimes are reluctant to take them because of a previous experience with constipation, but we reassure them that it does happen, but we're going to deal with it. And um, it used to be that we go to when I was back east, they were still teaching it this way that you, um, they, they called it mush and push, where you want to soften the stool and you want to give them a stimulant. Had you, have you heard that before, mush and push? So they say, so you got to give the um, a stool softener, which would be docosate, along with the stimulant, which would be Senecot. However, recent randomized controlled trials done here in Little Van, BC in Vancouver have shown that in the palliative care patient population and probably the frail elderly, that Colace actually doesn't add much benefit. Uh, patients have to take more pills. And in, if a patient has a low intake of fluid, it may actually make things worse rather than better. So Senecot, um, lac, uh, PEG, 17 grams once a day, it's my, sort of my go-to. I rarely use lactulose now if the patient can actually take a large volume because lactulose is an icky sweet taste that if they're a bit nauseated they're going to throw up, it causes bloating, can cause some cramping, and so I tend not to use that very much. So Senecot and PEG is what I use, and it's absolutely got to be the knee jerk. If you're ordering an op opioid at whatever dose, you need to be ordering a regular not PRN laxative and then adjust it up. Your goal that you're going to tell your patients and families and caregiving staff is we want to have a bowel movement that is non-painful, the patient does not need to strain, is as often as le at least as once every three days. And they don't need to have some, a suppository or an enema to have it. So that's what your goal is when you're looking at constipation. Dry mouth can be managed with artificial saliva, nausea and vomiting. About 60% of people get nausea and vomiting with an opioid, almost always, but depends on patient, you offer either a PRN or a regular um, anti-nauseant at the same time that you offer an opiate naive patient um, uh, an opioid um, and then get them to stop taking it after about a week. For, um, well it depends, if a patient is very um, pill adverse I will use haloperidol, just 0.5 BID but probably if you're thinking about nausea mechanistically, uh, where most of the anti-nauseant effect is related to gut motility, using Maxaran or perhaps even Domperidone um, is a good one. Um, sedation is also transient. I tell people to expect it, uh, not to be worried about it, and in about three to five days they will become more alert. Uh, if you don't tell them to expect it, it's just like an, an antidepressant medication, they won't take it. So you have to warn them about it. Night sweats, I still haven't figured out a good way to deal with that. Um, bad dreams, hallucinations, dysphoria, delirium, 
Myoclonus and seizures is only if you're neurotoxic. Paritis. It is, um, people can get itchy and actually have urticaria when they take opioids. It's unless it's associated with the bronchospasm and the angioedema, it's not an allergy, but many people will say they're allergic. Opioids, many of them, will cause a histamine release that'll make people itchy. You can manage that with Benadryl, which is, of course is very um, sedating in your population and may lead, to, um, may lead to delirium. So if someone is quite pruritic and has urticaria and or has urticaria, I will rotate them to a, a lower histamine release um, opioid such as fentanyl or methadone. And respiratory depression. Okay, I just have one thing to say about respiratory depression. This is one of the most common reasons that people do not get opioids because physicians and patients are worried about respiratory depression. I've had pharmacists call me and, and with concerns about a dose I've ordered because they're worried that this medication is going to cause the patient to stop breathing. First of all, sedation always precedes um, somebody stopping breathing. So if they're awake and alert, or if you can rouse them, it's unlikely that they're gonna stop breathing from an opioid. We've, there's been study after study of both opiate naive and opiate experienced patients when appropriately prescribed will slow respirations, but surprisingly, the O2 sats, the oxygenation, and the CO2 remains the same because they may slow their respiration, but actually their tidal volume compensates, and any statist will tell you that all the time. Even in COPD, it's part of the guidelines. If you've done everything you can do for your patient uh, for reversing uh, their COPD, uh, symptoms of COPD with steroids and their puffers and their oral medications, if they're still dyspneic, it's appropriate to give them opioids. You just might start at a lower dose. And after the break, we're going to talk about dosing. Okay. Can I have a discussion about side yes. effects? Questions about what? Side oh, side effects. Yeah. Yes. Well, sure. Um, thank you for asking for clarification. So if somebody has had a lot of nausea as part of their illness, I will start to get regularly. Or if they've had um, a or if they have um, experienced it with an opioid before, then I will start it regularly. And if they have no nausea, then I'll have them take it off. If they have not had nausea, they're kill it first, and they're just saying, give you this prescription. They think you should fill it, put it back in your cupboard, and take it off you get. And I'm pretty sure that some point along their history of their malignancy, they're going to be nauseated. <coughs> so they have that fact that's been in the whole time. So and I'm just curious. Uh, I don't know much about using a dense condoms, but would you ever use a dense condom? Uh, um, gravel? Um, gravel, no. Uh, very rarely. The only time I would use gravel, particularly in this population, is if there's a lot of vertigo associated with it, because it's particularly good for the vertiginous type that might come with either cerebellar tumor or uh, something um, that's interfering with their eighth nerve. Um, uh, gravel, delirium, sedation, falls, that stuff. Um, uh, on Danzatron, it has very limited indications. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. We can manage their, their nausea usually with much, weaker medi or much cheaper medications. You will find it used in many, many different instances. The chronic nausea associated with malignancy is not one of them that should be used. It's good uh, for toxic type um, nausea. So that type of nausea, when they throw up, and the nausea is not really used. And they throw up, and the nausea is not really used. That's the trigger that you've got a chemical induced nausea. And in that case, you need to use something that's targeted for chemically induced nausea, haloperidol, methotrimipresine is nausea, dead cheap drugs, very effective drugs. Um, on Danzatron, if all else fails. I will use on Danzatron if somebody has Parkinson's disease and they've got chemically induced nausea because I want to avoid um, uh, the Parkinson's side effects of those drugs. So very, in my practice, very limited indication. It's good for your kids who are arriving to emergency who are throwing up and throwing up and you want to get them out of the emergency. That's another indication, although some studies are suggesting that it's actually um, uh, maybe not as good as we thought for that. Um, and for acute nausea in the emergency, you'll see them use it a lot, even without much uh, evidence to back them up. I still think we should be using that and help them. That's what you're going to see. You use Decadron? With for? This woman comes in, a lot of bone pain. 
vomiting, nausea. Decadron works very well to relieve that nausea as well as treat a bone pain. Yes, it's excellent. Again, it's our secret weapon. Yeah. We don't know why um, the steroids... Use it in bowel obstruction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we don't know why the steroid particularly works for nausea and vomiting. I mean, it may be helpful if... Say you've got a peritoneal carcinomatosis, mm. and there's um, the seeding all through the peritoneum. And what's causing some of the nausea is the peristalsis. So you give them a dexamethasone, you have a massive anti-inflammatory effect you actually have better uh, peristalsis and motility. Mm -hmm. And um, so that may be one way that it's working. It may be reducing an obstruction or a partial obstruction. But they think there's something more to it in that it actually works um, in the pathways, the emetic pathways to reduce yeah. transmission. Um, but it wouldn't be my first go-to. It would be, um, uh, I would use it as a second, a third, exactly. possibly fourth line, or if I'm trying to have other benefits mm -hmm. as well. But yes, it is also good for nausea. What about the cannabinoid receptor? Yes, can, can, cannabinoids, um, some patients find them very helpful. Um, uh, uh, and I'm going to speak to that a little bit later, but very briefly. Um, but it is fifth, sixth line cannabinoids and would be particularly helpful for patients who have um, a lot of what we would call total. Um, so if you've got sights, smells, um, uh, Experiences that cause me to I get a lot of nausea when I'm anxious, so I know that when I get sick, can it works really well for me because I have a lot of emotion associated with my nausea. Um, for the patient who had experience of nausea when they had chemotherapy, and whenever they drive to the cancer clinic and they're starting to throw up, um, uh, that is a situation that can be very effective. And I had a woman sitting in a wheelchair in my little outpatient clinic, which is actually a room at the very back of the hospice. Um, sitting in her wheelchair and yeah. her yeah. was that yeah. Yeah. And yeah. she had little um, <clears throat> caramels that she was eating like every half hour. Um, but she's going to feel a lot better with the health care. Mm -hmm. Isn't there the, uh, I can't think of the name of it, there's a pill form that's available. Navalone. Navalone. That's Navalone, yeah. 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 I would, I use that on occasion, but after I've tried other things. And sometimes the patients, I'm not taking that, I'm not taking that, that's not natural, that's not natural. And maybe, but I don't find it's particularly effective, not for my patients who are so sick. And jo Joyce, my experience, I've used Navalone about six times, and every single one of my patients got delirious. And I got asked, I was asked to use it, I was arm twisted by families, give them pot. This is before there were pot stores, right? And I can say, and I'm, I'm talking about people who are in their late 80s, 90s, very frail. I can't speak to the people who are younger who could tolerate it, but I saw one lady almost died from delirium mm -hmm. from it. Yeah, there's a from a nurse board. He's, um, he's in his 50s, so it's not exactly a patient population, but he was really complaining that he was confused. Doc, I'm just not about confusion. And um, so, you know, looked for calcium, looked for, um, uh, you did a, bone, a, a brain scan. What? Brain mats? Why is he so confused? And, did serial sevens with him. This is a guy who owns his own business and accounting and he couldn't do serial sevens and he was quite upset by this. So we were sitting in rounds and then someone said, oh, where are Mr. So-and-so's uh, marijuana cigarettes? And he says, oh, they're in his drawer at the back of the whatever. And I'm like, oh, now I know why. I'm Because he's token up on the, on the patio five times a day. Okay, done. So now I want you to flip over the page. And working in groups of two or three, whatever feels right, four if that feels right, um, uh, there's some problems there. And I want you to go through and do the equal analgesic problems, and then we're for the next. Can we do that for 10 minutes, uh, Ian? Yes. Okay, and then we're going to go through them together, and I've got it all, the answers on a PowerPoint slide. Every one of them thought, you know what, I like practice doing equal analgesic dosing, and so they said it's always helpful. So. Um, I would appreciate some feedback on whether you thought this was a helpful exercise. And so what I've done is um, just gone through a possible way of solving each one of these. So this, uh, so he's on 36 twice a day. So to get a 24-hour dose, first of all, so we're trying to change him over to subcutaneous, right? Essentially. So 72 milligrams orally in 24 hours. 
Divide that be by six to get a Q4 hour dose, so you get 12 milligrams every four hours orally. And then you divide that by two um, to make that a subcutaneous dose, so that becomes sub, uh, six milligrams. And there's some in the states you'll say it's a, they'll say it's a one to three because they're always worried medical legally, you know, use one to three, um, but we still use uh, one to two. But what we do do, and this is a step that is usually missed and can get you into trouble, is that 30% decrease for possible change in absorption, even when it's the same drug. You should usually drop it down by whatever is reasonable and easy. I, this says 30%. I have to say I'm usually more in the 20, 25% decrease. But the textbooks will say 30. So that's 4.2 milligrams. And so what you might end up writing is morphine. You might start it for, so the way I would write this a little bit differently. I would write morphine, <coughs> four milligrams, sub Q, Q4H, and then I would put in brackets, range four to six. So the nurses know to start at four, but they have an ability to go up to six with a half dose for breakthrough pain as needed. So uh, the breakthrough pain usually on our ward for subcutaneous, we would say every 30 minutes for breakthrough. My, with, with your group, I might offer it a little, say a little bit more, maybe every hour. Every hour would be reasonable. Not every, not Q2H. If it, if it hasn't helped by an hour, it's probably not going to help. And if the person's still in pain, they should receive another breakthrough. Mrs. Jones has not had good pain relief. Her opioid dose has been increasing steadily for two weeks. Currently on morphine 60 subcut Q4H with a half scheduled dose for, for a breakthrough dose. She rates her pain at 4 to 5 out of 10, and she's jittery. So she's got some side effects, and we're going to need to rotate her to a different medication, in this case, hydromorphone. So 10 milligrams of uh, morphine is equivalent to 2 milligrams of hydromorphone. Morphine to hydromorphone is 5 to 1. So 60 divided by 5 is, di is dilated 12. 30% decrease for possible change in absorption and, or changing our cross tolerance. Um, because they, they hit slightly different uh, receptors. And so um, 12 milligrams times 0.7 to get that 30% reduction is 8.4. However, she's in pain, so you might be a little bit less conservative than that. So you might sort of go, okay, a little bit of an art as well as a science. I'm going to start at 9, but have a range up to 12. Hmm? No, I'm happy for you to barge in. By our pharmacy, our uh -huh. app, which I imagine is represents FEMA, uh -huh. that they will no longer accept changes on regular dosages coming up very soon. Okay. Well, that's something I wasn't aware of, yeah. that they won't something accept changes. We're still using this which is, which Tragic. I feel is a bit of a shame, really, mm -hmm. because it Tragic. reduces the autonomy yeah. of Yeah, because people are getting treated. And um, nurses, they take away the nurses' capable, autonomy. Uh, yeah, I bet it has to do with uh, that. I bet it has to do with eye health. Like, it's a computer yeah, so thing, right? So that's something to watch for and, and, and that's my guess maybe troubleshoot with your team on how you're going to cope with that. Eye health. Ice cream. Yeah, that is unfortunate. I see you go to when you have your LPNs and a lot of them are not familiar with that range. So the LPNs. always give the lower, give the lower range. Right. So the LPNs will always give the lower dose. And I, I think. With your guys's, with your guys's practice, where you're going to be in more often for the reassessment, um, it might be you know if you know that someone's in pain and you've written the order, you might ask the person who's coming on the next day. I don't know if that's how you guys might work together. To can you just check and if it's not enough, you can you increase the dose? So that, and you're absolutely right, Chris, that. Uh, we might be asking too much of the bedside nurses who aren't trained to give these medications and might be very fearful. The other way, instead of um, Catherine, I, Catherine, I just wonder if one of the ways we might respond to this is instead of saying they're not educated and comfortable with these medications and it's not safe, is maybe instead of making a rule that we can't do it, <laughs> maybe we should be instituting education programs for the patient, for the caregivers who are giving the medication. Um, and I think that's really um, an area that you guys could take and run with for educating uh, the staff um, around pain. Or you could request it and yeah. perhaps even provide it to the staff. 
You see, for the HS dose, uh -huh. it usually orally one doubles it, but for the sub Q, you keep it Q4. So yes, yeah, so so it should be if when you're first initiating a medication, I tend not to use the double dose at HS and then omit yeah. the middle of the night dose just to see how they're doing on it. Um, but you can double the HS dose even if it's subcutaneous even and omit okay. and omit the middle of the night dose. Absolutely. Another neat way to give the subcutaneous medications, and I wonder about speaking with your pharmacist about it, is there are continuous access um, devices, the CAD pumps. Catherine, do you have them in your facility, the I CAD pumps? I have seen them, but I think we can get them. Mm -hmm. So what they are is um, they're really a cassette that you fill up with 100 or 50 mils of a subcutaneous medication. And it runs, so if you're going to be giving, say you want to give it four milligrams subcutaneous every four hours, that's the dose you would give. Then what you would do is just say you get the program to one milligram per hour, and then they actually have a, either a patient or a caregiver assisted button that gets pushed. And what it does is it prevents the nurses from having to go, pull up the medication, you know, I've got it right, can you check with me, you know, so the, the these poor staff are very heavily overburdened and when it becomes an every four hours injection, it can become a burden. So if you can get a CAD pump, which I use a lot in the home because it reduces a strain on the family, that can be very effective. Now that will be negotiating with your group who's going to pay for it, who's going to fill it, but I would encourage you to sort of look down that road because um, it will make it much easier to care for your palliative care patients. Christine, how many people finished going through these? Like, did you did you guys write answers for three and four? Okay, all right, because we got about five minutes left, so I just okay. judging what we're going to do with uh, our time there. Okay, she continues to have pain. She's got. She's. I'll just go right to answers. Okay, so dilated twelve milligrams sub Q six times is equal to seventy two milligrams in twenty four hours. Six milligrams sub Q times six. 36 milligrams, that must be for the breakthrough. Yeah, that's for the breakthrough. You add them together, so you get 108 milligrams of hydromorphone for 24 hours. And then you divide that by six to get the new Q4 hourly dosing. No change in route or medication, so there's no need to reduce for possible change in absorption. And a possible order might be 18 to 22 sub Q, Q4H with a half dose. And the last one, stable pain control, but we're trying to get over to a fentanyl patch. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dilated three milligrams orally every four hours um, is equal to morphine, 15, because of the five times multiplication. Morphine, 10 milligrams Q4H, equals about a 25 microgram fentanyl patch. So you've got your dosing of total 24 hour morphine, and I'll just give you what I use. It's just easy to remember. A 50 microgram patch, is about equal to giving someone 20 milligrams of morphine every four hours. And I just hold that in my head, and that makes a really easy transition. So morphine 15 is about equal to 37.5 micrograms of fentanyl. 30% decrease for possible change in absorption or decreased cross tolerance, and so you get about 26.25, and so you might order a fentanyl 25 microgram patch. And I always tell the families and the patients that we have an idea of how much fentanyl you're going to need. Um, it, we might overdo it a bit, we might underdo it a bit, but we promise to monitor and we'll respond and increase if need be or decrease if need be. And always having available that breakthrough is really important. But there's another step here. How long does it take for a fentanyl patch to kick in? Twelve. Twelve hours. Yeah, so some studies say 10 to 12, some studies say 24, some studies say, we say about 17 when I'm talking to people. But that wouldn't be incorrect. And so the, the mistake I see, the pitfall I see a lot, is um, uh, the fentanyl patch will go on and the other medication is discontinued. So you really have to cover that poor patient for the time that it takes the fentanyl patch to begin to kick in. And so you put the patch on in the morning and you give the scheduled dilated dose. I usually only give two more, but some people, and in this case, three were given at the time the patch goes on, then another one, then another one, then another one. They might be a bit over sedated on that last one, but they won't be in pain, hopefully. And then use the breakthrough um, uh, dose orally as needed. So there. 
Great. So if you notice, so it's every seven years. But if you notice that on that third day, the person is using more breakthroughs on that last day, they might be one of the few people. It's not common to need to change it every four hours. Um, but it is possible. So if you go, oh, they always seem to be every three days and more breakthroughs, and they would change every 48 hours. There was uh, an article that came out in one of the journals that said that at, in cachectic people that you might have varying absorption. And so we discussed this as a group because we thought well, many of our patients were so frail and cachectic. And we decided it wouldn't actually change our practice because what we do is we choose a dose and then we assess side effects and its efficacy. So we still even in the cachectic person. I've only had one instance in my practice where I rotated them from uh, oral or sub-Q medication, can't remember which it was, to a fentanyl patch and the pain control was horrible. I, and I just couldn't figure it out, took the fentanyl patch on, put them back on the other medication, and they got back to excellent pain control. So I don't know if it was a lousy batch or what happened, but usually it works over, it works just fine. I'm one of the number one fentanyl patch prescribers in the province. I've got my letter. Number one. And I'm, I'm, are you funded by the, the drug company? Not at all. Not at all. I use generic Teva. I'm funded by Teva generics. But, um, but uh, I got my letter a number of years ago, and, my, my, and I had to send my notes to the college. And I've never had an overdose, from, a death from fentanyl that I'm aware of, or overdose. But um, there is a, about 20% of people, you'll find that that last day is a bad day for them, and um, you know, with chronic pain. And rather than pumping up the dose of fentanyl where they get side effects, I just say every 48 hours, boom, it's done in a lot of the people. So I, and it's a little bit more expensive, right? because you're using an expensive patch every 40 instead of 72, but you end up, that way you can prevent that sort of side effect and you still get really good pain control. So I have a thing around breakthrough dosing. So what yeah. frequently happens when we go and we look at the breakthroughs, we just look at the, the MAR and we say, oh, they had six breakthroughs in 24 hours, okay, let's just up the patch, whatever. But the important piece is what are the circumstances around those breakthroughs? So looking at the pattern of breakthroughs, the is last. it on the last day? <coughs> or yeah. are they actually, it's when they're moving. So when they're getting up and moving, they're having pain and needing a breakthrough. In that case, the choice is not to increase the fentanyl patch, but to rather to give them some preemptive opioid. Because sure. if you increase the fentanyl patch or their baseline opioid to cover them for the time that they're moving and having more pain, then you're going to zonk them out completely for when they're sitting, wanting to have dinner or watch TV or have a conversation with their family. And so the, that those preemptive dosing uh, opioids can be very helpful. And if we have time, maybe later we'll talk about that, or I can come back another time and talk to you about preemptive dosing. So, um, when somebody says to me, fentanyl patch is not lasting three days, uh -huh. is this person selling their fentanyl patch? Oh, you always have to be wondering. But that's, that's what I worry about. Sure. They need the fentanyl, but... You know, there's such a market for fentanyl patches. You know, I, I just, you know, I just always, I, I'm not saying I'm going to accuse, but I just get a, a kind of warning light. Just another reassessment of the patient yeah, because, you know, it should last three days. And so I, I just, a, just a talk. I, I just deal with geriatrics. So, yeah, no, but, I, just talk, talk about but I see your point is a good point, but yeah. there is a real group of people who metabolize this drug yeah. differently. Oh, yes. oh, no, I know, I know, but I just. And you know, one day, one, a couple of years ago, there was this lady who was so sick with metastatic colon cancer. And she had a lot of pain, and I was giving her oxycodone, because that's what she had been on. And she was coming to see me every couple of weeks, because I had a few worries about her. And, but thought, no, she's not, she's not depressed, she's not, no, no. And I could not get my head around it. And then she started coming in, and, and she would always comment on my clothes. Oh, I really like your boots, Dr. Jones. Oh, nice jacket, Dr. Jones. And so, so she's complimenting me. So that should have been like, be, should be really nice to me as I'm writing her a prescription for opioids. And um, and then she started coming in with a nice new pair of boots and a nice new jacket. <laughs> and then how are things going at home? I just got a new TV. It's like it's huge. It's gr I'm, 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 she's so. Uh, yeah, you do have to be aware of it. And even in our palliative care patients where we, where we want to be kind and believe they're having pain and 
um, that sometimes even I write an opioid, uh, opioid contract with them, and it doesn't stop the problem of misuse or diversion, but it um, makes, there's a paper trail that I considered it, um, and also it's up there right front and center that you're not allowed to do that. And that if I find you're doing that, then I'm going to stop prescribing for you, even though you're dying. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.